So anyway, you can keep talking now. <laughs> um, no, I was just saying, like, I think like one of the biggest missing links that, you know, current day yoga isn't addressing is the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, we're, it, we're in this constant sympathetic spinal chain arousal and we're going and we're quote unquote exercising and our muscles just, they never relax. The system's never, you know, receiving it. It's, you know, it's a fight or an, or a run or we're paralyzed in it. And, and I just, I don't think people are truly gaining the full benefits of yoga if they're not looking at the flexibility of a healthy nervous system. So I love somatics. I love, mm -hmm. you know, anything that's really looking at how, you know, we're regulating our, our nervous system, you know, whether that's in activity or meditation or language or whatever. So. You know, that's funny you say that because we, this month is the month of yoga and I decided to focus it. Curious about that one. <laughs> yes. Like a while ago I read in yoga journal that they made it oh. September the month of yoga. And I'm like, that's my birthday month. I could go with that <laughs> today. Today? Shut up. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> ah, another of a, a close and a dear old friend of mine, Sue Elkin. It's her birthday too. Mine was um, just five days ago, I think. Or, or mine was on, um, yeah, Saturday. Happy belated birthday. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So I'm really excited to have you here because this month I want to focus on the koshas. I'm focusing on Anamaya Kosha this week. I'm focusing on men specifically because unfortunately I've been hearing a lot of unfortunate feedback and it's men are feeling lonely. They're sad. They don't have an outlet. Then just recently I was on a, on a training call uh, with off the mat into the world and we were talking about marginalizations and Seth brought up a very interesting comment and he said well there is a marginalization in yoga and it's men because we all women get all the attention but men really don't and and then we have to live up to this expectation or we have to look a certain way we have to be a certain way and I thought that was really interesting because it's a stigma and so I, I was like, well, you know, I know a lot of great male yoga teacher leaders that can share their voice and, and highlight a lot of what yoga is in the male world. And another comment that I heard in, that, in, this, in this meeting was from, it was a, a Yoga Alliance actually a sponsored event. And one of the ladies had said, well, the reason why Yoga Journal doesn't put a man on the cover is because they almost went bankrupt one time. And from then, they never did it again. So there was a marginalization within a marginalization because, wow, not only do we already have the issue with women dealing with yoga catered to one type of women, but now we have men feeling even more kind of separated from this wellness world feeling like, no, it's, it's only really for women and, and it's getting away from the male um, environment or the male community. And I think you had mentioned, and I know you had said something about yoga was actually created for 15 year old boys to get ready for, for, for battle basically in, uh, in India. And so it really started from a male perspective, just like Pilates started from a male perspective. And then women really jumped on. So I'd love to have you talk about yoga, what it's done for you, how you, I know yoga has been in your life forever. Um, I look at you and I just, I see you in a cave in India. <laughs> I'm not <Yeah>. sure <laughs> to be, I mean, I guess it's who's with me in the cave maybe <laughs> to get exciting, but um, well, just to clarify too, I, I would say that modern Hatha yoga, mm -hmm. you know, was repurposed in the 20th century, you know, by Krishnamacharya to one politically help redefine an, an identity of an, of a, of a ancient Indian practice amongst a more mod, a more Western British colonialism that would give Indians something excited to fight for. Mm -hmm. right and fight against 
And that, that modern Hatha yoga then was, uh, uh, you know, was then being used to help train those young men to, you know, for battle, which is super ironic. But when you look at the word Hatha, it means violence. So maybe it's not so ironic. And, you know, and I think what we have when we do use the word yoga in the West is something that has been so distilled down to an experience of, you know, more physicality on a yoga, you know, what we, what we call a yoga mat nowadays. Mm -hmm. And that physical practice has certainly in a Western body, you know, been more easy to adapt to women because of, you know, more associations towards flexibility and things like that. So, you know, it's, it is interesting, the history, because I mean, if you go to India, you know, it, it was primarily only a men's, um, initiation and something, you know, women were for the most part pushed out except for, you know, certain tantrika um, sex in, in that kind of way, you know, but when, when it's here in America, it certainly is, I think it's a dominated by women. And yet from a business side and from, you know, those leading, at least pioneering American teachers, I do think a lot of it was men. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's a very similar to like the cooking industry where you have a lot of prominent male chefs that are primarily speaking to a female audience. Mm -hmm. And then that has shifted in the last couple of decades where you have a lot more of a female, you know, chef prominence. And, and we're seeing that a lot more today with a lot more of, a, of, of these elevated and celebrated female yoga teachers, you know, leading more of the industry. But certainly, I, I would say the, the primary population in yoga classes is, is women. Mm -hmm. And how, does, how do men feel comfortable is, is a, you know, a really you know, important aspect to it. How does somebody you know, who's larger feel comfortable? How does somebody of color feel comfortable? There's lots of these little groups in there. So your, your question was about me and, and what was it about yoga exactly? My well you, know, that, you said a lot of great points. You actually hit on everything that this whole entire conversation is really about. And, and it's about well, how, how do you now relate to yoga as a man that you have observed, you know, seeing what you've seen, observing yeah. what you've observed and speaking to that as well. Um, can you elaborate? And, yeah. and even being married to a fellow yoga teacher, you know, who is very affluent in this in the community that we know and recognize. So how, how does that relationship work and how does your relationship work with yoga? How did you come into yoga and what is the perspective you would offer men to feel more secure about approaching yoga? So not all I at once. I <laughs> started when I was 18 and um, I turned 44 last week. And so my fascination with yoga was a fascination with a, a romance with the other, you know, like I was fast, I was, I was fascinated with counterculture, you know, in that, in that case for me in high school, it was, you know, the grateful dad and the hippie movement and, and, you know, drugs and, you know, whatever sort of was a counter to this mainstream pop culture of America. And there was this fascination with like the ancient Chinese, you know, and like, you know, Kung Fu and, and, and whatever it was, but I, I had no like teaching. I didn't like, like know anything about it. It was just, it was just like this romanticism. And when I got sick in my freshman year of college and I moved back to my parents and a yoga studio had opened in the town I lived and my sister was going, you know, it was all of a sudden like, Oh, what's this? And you know, it was, in an office building, you know, it was as vanilla and boring as it could be. It was, there was no chanting, there was no bells and whistles of, of you know, what I would, I was looking for, but there was this very uh, charismatic young man who, you know, in his twenties with a lot of, um, you know, just vibrancy to him. And he became my first teacher and he was, very American male. And yet at the same time, he had this almost um, 
like what I might call like a, a false self image of, of, you know, like, a, like a, like a facade of the, you know, spiritual person, very soft and compassionate, you know, like, you know, walking around and, and um, quiet kind of meditator. And he introduced me to a lot, you know, I'm super grateful. You know, I was taken to many Buddhist meditation retreats and, and taken under his wing and all of this. And, and, but for me as a male, I had a very common theme. I had very charismatic men who grew up very much in American culture, who were my teachers from the age of 18 to essentially 28. And they really shaped so much of how I saw the world. And I'm not saying that was good. I'm saying it just worked for me as a man, right? As, as, a, as a young man, particularly. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of habits, you know, behaviors um, in there that represented very much a white dominant male American culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I adapted those quite a bit, mm -hmm. you know, and when I was 28 and everything came kind of crashing down and I lost all of those teachers and connections and all of that, you know, I found myself, you know, mar you know, with, with my wife and, and relationship and, and, you know, and then in more of that typical role that, that we might see today where, you know, I was the lead figure, a male lead figure inside of a yoga studio that was really primarily women. Mm -hmm. And I was then the primary voice. And I didn't have enough at that time experience and wisdom to understand how much I was replicating all of the models of the male ego, the American male ego that came before me. Mm -hmm. And that had to play out, you know, that had to play out in whatever um, transgressional behaviors and egoic um, ways of, of, of thinking and communicating until kind of like it all came crashing down. And, mm -hmm. and I sort of like lost all that. And it, it was it wasn't great, you know, like, you know, studios and communities and, and, and these sorts of things. And and then when we moved here to Chicago about six years ago, I thought like I would come here and kickstart and be part of a new movement of, of yoga movement, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but no one wanted it. It was like full on rejection. And mm -hmm. it was at that moment where I, I paused and I just was like, you know, I'm like the guy who keeps hitting his head against the wall, but nothing's changing, you know, except I'm just getting, you know, beat up. So I stopped and, you know, I met a different kind of teacher, um, part of like more of an angelic kind of reformation. Mm -hmm. um, and I went like dark, like really deep mm -hmm. inside for, for a few years. I stopped teaching mm -hmm. and I realized like there was a lot of healing, you know, that I had never um, addressed. And there was a lot of my own habits and patterns and ways of, of operating that had never really been refined in all the years of practice. Mm -hmm. That it was, you know, let me do this yoga pose. And oh my God, I was good at doing yoga poses. So just because I was good at doing yoga poses, I was somehow seen as, you know, better or knowing more about yoga. And, you know, I was 24 leading national workshops. Mm -hmm. Now, that's 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. A lot has happened in 20 years in my life. And I look at 24-year-olds today and I think, like, mm -hmm. that was me 20 years ago. And yet, what, what did I really know? You know, what did I really know? I mean, at 44, what do I really know today? I mean, I know more <laughs> than 24. I don't know more than somebody who's at 64 who's been doing this for 40 years, you know? So... I had to really look at who I was as a, as a, as a man, mm. you know, as a father, as a husband, as, as, as a, um, as a human. And a lot of that came kind of crashing into my lap. And, and thankfully I had really good friends around and really amazing support with my wife and, and, you know, my family and, and things of that nature. And 
I probably didn't expect to come back to teaching. Something happened with my wife and she was like, can you do this with me? I was like, all right, I don't have a, I don't have a moment to think about it. So it's just a yes. And then it was boom, I was put back in it. And I'm grateful for that because I realized this is my gift, you know, but if I didn't take that time away, I wouldn't have realized how much I never was actually changing who I was from the inside out. I was just, you know, glorifying the outside of myself, which was a, mm. such a, a Western, a Westernized, you know, adaptation of, of what I think I started, I, I, I'm today, you know, realizing is more about yoga. And, you know, so over those, over these last, you know, four or five years and, and, the, and that time of just going deep inside, you know, my, my relationship to yoga is, is, is completely different. Like, I don't care about yoga asana, um, you know, the, the postures of it. I mean, I do care about it, but it's not, it's not like what I think yoga is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I think about like when we hear like, oh, you, you know, are you, you know, I'm a yoga teacher. Oh, so you must be flexible. You know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, my nervous system's flexible. Mm -hmm. You know, my hamstrings may or may not be, and I don't really care if they are or not, <laughs> as long as they're healthy but my nervous system's flexible. And that's where I really started studying a lot more about, you know, our biology and our chemistry and, you know, how all of these things affect, you know, what is, you know, our nervous system and what's innervating and how that's creating relationships and communication. And, and, and you know, ultimately, like really this truly sense of, of health, uh, redefining things like you mentioned, you know, Shakti and, mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that idea of energy, you know, energy sounds so woo woo, you know, in 1995 as, you know, mm -hmm. an 18 year old boy, you know, living in Detroit, Michigan, you know, and, and like, and, you know, that, that like energy was like the Carolyn Miss, you know, like <laughs> spirit. And it's like, okay, but what is energy? Like, well, as a, as someone who loves science, it's mitochondria. You know, it's the very nature of who we are. We are, we are more mitochondria than everything else put together in the human body. And it is as ancient of a bacteria as anything on this planet. So then I start thinking, what's Shakti? You know, Shakti is the, the divine feminine that is energy, power, you know, like, like an electric, electricity. What is mitochondria? Well, you only inherit your mother's mitochondrial DNA. So we are all the divine feminine. It's, wow. It is more than everything else in our human body. What's Shakti? It's, it's, it's the manifestation of everything in this world. Mm -hmm. It's your energy, your power, and it is transported through an electrical chain in your human body. I'm thinking like, oh my God, this is what the yogis must've been talking about. So what's the secret to yoga? It's, it is making energy right? Which is truly, you know, something that is, that you can replenish, right? We can't make more time. It's not, time isn't the thing that, you know, oh, I don't have time for this. Oh, I'm late. I, no, what that says to me is someone doesn't have energy. Mm -hmm. So like yoga has become this fascinating interest in, in modern day science, mm -hmm. in ancient, you know, folkloric wisdom that merges together to really understand how do I, you know, create the highest output with the least amount of effort mm -hmm. you know, to have, you know, just like a beautiful life mm -hmm. and the eight and, limbs of yoga, <laughs> you know? And so, and so what I found is like my asana practice was stressful, you know, it was wow. more harmful than, than beneficial the way I was practicing. So then I had to learn more, you know, I had like, what is it about our human body? Like, you know, a South Asian body, these, these asana practices, none of them were all that scientific. None of them were meant to be the way, or not, I shouldn't say meant to be, none of them were, were expected or taught from, those, from, the, from the past to how we do it today. Mm -hmm. So now we're, we're incorporating things that, you know, stretch across an enormous a, a range of, of fitness and exercise. So let's learn more about that. Let's mm -hmm. incorporate, you know, let's see, like, just because you're flexible doesn't mean your muscle isn't tight. I had extremely tight, like, I don't even use the word tight anymore. I had extremely long muscles that mm -hmm. could never relax mm -hmm. from overstretching, mm -hmm. from over elongating everything. Yeah. There, you know, a massage therapist would touch me and be like, wow, your muscles are really tense. Mm -hmm. And I'd, 
Tense? What are you talking about tense? I, I can put my leg behind my head. Screw you. I'm not tight. You know, like, but then I had to learn, like, there was nothing relaxed about my system. You know, my, my system was so chronically stressed mm -hmm. from doing yoga poses. Mm -hmm. How ironic was that, you know, right. from meditating, you know, like from, from the instructions of my teachers where the language was, mm -hmm. was unknowingly to me activating, you know, like traumatic experiences, pay attention. Mm. Oh my God, my school teacher told me to pay attention. I didn't want to pay attention. Or my parents yelled at me for the, you know, and then all of a sudden I'm back in this, you know, oh, and, and, and so it took me starting to really investigate and to have thankfully an amazing array of, of such skillful, you know, brilliant people that shifted, you know, the tenderness of all of this, you know, the, and, and, and how, the language, right? Like the body language of an asana or the language of an instruction, you know, the language of my breath. I mean, I used to breathe and it would be like, I can breathe longer and louder and bigger. And then I'm realizing, oh my God, that was creating, you know, all of this, un, you know, dis-ease inside my body. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, where I stand today is that I'm a much more spacious human being. Mm -hmm with a much you know wiser approach that there is no way to do something there's just an, a, a many different suggestions mm -hmm. and as you're really listening as i'm really listening i tune in and i just i, I grab a skill you know that is welcomed for that moment to help me you know, once again, find the regulation, the flexibility of my system mm -hmm. to, you know, do what it needs to do, whether that's run, fight, freeze, relax, or, or a, a hybrid of those. Right. Um, so, and that's how I approach teaching. You know, I don't tell anybody what to do. I invite them into an intelligent conversation of suggestions mm -hmm. to try. Mm -hmm. And to trust the one that they choose is the one that works for them. Mm -hmm. And it might change. I love that. I want to ask you, you said something really, um, really profound in, in the beginning of our, of our conversation. And you kind of also remind me a lot of the Journey Home book with Rahanath Swami um, in the hippie movement and the Grateful Dead and how he found his, move, his kind of his path too, which I thought was so just aligned. And what I really liked what you said was that you recognized that when you, you had the crashing down moment with the ego and the communities, can you explain how you recognize that ego and community crashing down moment, that, that parallel, that transition, that epoch in your life when all of that happened? Yeah. Um, well, the, the community crashing down was easy because, I mean, it was literally, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I was blacklisted and ostracized from, from an entire community, you know, my career. Why? How? Um, that's a long story. Oh, okay. <laughs> another, another one. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, essentially I was a pivotal, you know, student and teacher inside of a yoga community. Mm -hmm. And there was some disagreements occurring within the community, some confusion. And I was at the focal point of that because I because two, the two main teachers were not aligning as a vision. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the main people that held those two people together. Oh, wow. And, um, and I chose one and I chose the side that wasn't the popular one. And my integrity was, you know, in a sense being asked to either be in this community, but not really be in it, but be using it, you know, to gain, you know, financial success or whatever from it, mm. or to just say like, I don't, this isn't, you know, what feels right. I'm not, I'm not representing it to the way that that is there. And so I chose to leave. Mm -hmm. And the irony is when I chose to leave the one teacher whose system it was, the other teacher who I had stood up for left me. Wow. Because he felt like it was now going to ruin you know, what he had with this other, with this community. So when I left that community, I was, I was heartbroken and I was angry. Mm. And 
anger is an interesting emotion, you know, because it, I think it's so, the ego, I think really comes out in anger a lot. And the, and the ego, I think holds the anger, you know? Yeah. Um, and over time I released that kind of anger. At least I thought I did, but I didn't really, I, it just, mm -hmm. it just dissipated enough, you know, and it, and it was sort of replaced by hopefulness in an innocent kind of way, not like the wise kind of hope, mm -hmm. you know, like someone said, you know, you can't, uh, like you, you can't having running a business. I think it was on shark tank where I get most of my great <laughs> Um, it was sort of like, you know, a business plan can't be like, I hope this is going to happen. Right. Right. And that was sort of like, I think my innocence in that time was that wisdom wasn't really wisdom. It was naivety. It was, it was just, it was like the pure hopefulness of something that somebody was going to change. And then because of that, like I would reap some gain from it. So many years after I'd left, I ended up rejoining with that teacher that I had left and he was teaching something new. Wow. And there was some great healing in that, but then it also ended up becoming exactly the same thing that it was before. Like he yeah. hadn't changed and maybe I hadn't changed or maybe I changed enough because I recognized early on that this just sucked. But unfortunately I had to ruin more parts of what I had created in my life, you know, to, uh, it was, it was like really that sort of like full crash and burn, you know, like it was like really losing everything, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was, it's sort of like when the banking industry in 2008, you know, blew up <laughs> and we, and the American people bailed them out with their tax dollars, you know, mm -hmm. they just rallied and are doing the same thing again, you know? So it's like, here we are, you know, and that was like me until like it all just fell apart. And not only did I, I lost another community and this one was, you know, business and, and finances and, and, and I sort of lost like my hope, you know, mm -hmm. like the, the, the naive, innocent, hoping person mm -hmm. just went away and darkness. Mm -hmm. I mean, like it was, I think really the first time I kind of entered into that heroes type journey mm -hmm. where I had to really meet my own inner monsters because at 18 or 19, I was so young. I was just like so malleable and pliable and everything was, you know, really handed to me. I mean, I earned it and I was great at it, but I never struggled so deeply mm. to gain it, to have it. And even when I lost it the first time, you know, I met my wife and she had a yoga studio. I instantly moved in there. And then we had this six, super successful thriving studio and it was okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's like where like the ego, I think in that sort of regard, and I, I don't think the ego is a bad thing mm -hmm. in any kind of way. I think that I just didn't know how to really behave. Like I didn't really know how to listen. Mm -hmm. I think that's really what it was. I say this a lot. Like now when mm -hmm. I lead trainings and I talk about holding space, mm -hmm. about that word holding spaces, yeah. I used to mistake it, but I didn't know. I used to control the space. Mm. The teacher I'd walk in and I would be controlling, not listening. Mm. I, this is what we're going to do. And, oh, you have an injury. I already know what's wrong with you. I don't need to listen to you, you know? Mm. And now when I come in to hold the space, it's to literally just have spaciousness mm -hmm. and to listen and to be able to have people feel safe and brave mm -hmm. to be able to do the work they need to do, not to try to tell them what they need to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that became the big shift in that sort of ego notion. It, it really was around this, you know, listening. Mm -hmm. And when I became, when I got better at listening, you know, what really became better was like my relationships, you know, who I am as a father, my, you know, my relationship with my wife. And these are things that have, you know, have, have keep growing and are only getting better. Yeah. Yeah. And that I do think is a very difficult part for men. You know, we're not great listeners <laughs> to listen, you know, that's not what, you know, the qualities of the, of the American male archetype is. Right. It's, you know, it, there's like a stoicism, maybe the Marlboro man, but I don't think the Marlboro man's really like 
in tune with his you know empathic self to hold that kind of space it might be like them oh yeah good job you know like there might be a grunt kind of thing but like it's how deeply are we really listening to emotion mm -hmm. which means that we're also then you know watching movement you know how how deeply are we really tuning in you know to you know how how we connect which is not you know fight or flee or freeze mm -hmm. but like you know how can we be immobilized in love or or mobilized because of love mm -hmm. you know we're mobilized because you know of of fear or we're you know immobilized because of fear mm -hmm. and underneath you know a lot of my own struggles was the insecurity of you know i'm not good enough i'm not going to provide you know you know my own fears of of who i am and and how am I seen and what's my identity? And in a world where that's never been stronger with social media and, you know, if you're not broadcasted and recognized and liked and, you know, like these are all, you know, then, then are you successful? Mm -hmm. you know? And I don't think yoga is, is seen as in, in a business model of success, the way that we have, you know, created for America, you know, it's not mm -hmm. a contest. It's not something we're judged on. You know, it's like really, truly, you know, as my wife said the other night, as we were, you know, talking about um, our, our class for the week, you know, it's like yoga is really just about loving your body. Mm -hmm. like, like, so you're going through all these different poses and these transitions. And it's like, are you beating yourself up? Are you judging yourself? Are you putting so much effort? Or are you really like, oh my God, I can love myself right now. And I can love myself today when I feel a little heavier, or when I don't feel as open or when I feel you know, like this or like that, like that's the relationship, mm -hmm. you know? And so if you're loving yourself and you need to, you know, do something, then you're able to activate, you know, movement, you know, strength, you know, whatever. Um, if you're, you know, really able to love yourself, like at the end, like in a Shavasana, you can lay there, right? Mm -hmm. And be vulnerable, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and be relaxed while you're you're paralyzed why do you find men like the marlboro man identity and those that identify with the marlboro man a lot of them that stereotype or that type of of identity connected personality why do they feel so intimidated by the practice of yoga you feel or kind of like how you had like a oh, good job bird well i can't I mean, answer it's kind of uh, Why that type of personality would, would feel so apprehensive? Is that more of a going back to what we talked about, just this conditioned beliefs that we were brought up with and how we, we associated our surroundings and our environments with? Could that be something that also contributes to maybe the disassociation, juxtapose the marketing that's being exposed to them as well? That it makes it not masculine enough for them to do yoga or... I think that yoga has changed a lot in the mm -hmm. 25 years that I've been in it. And I do think a lot of it is catered towards men in marketing and things of that nature more and more. And, and, and the reason I do think it's catered more is because it's, it's a household thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't seen in the same ways as it was, you know, when I did yoga, you know, when I started yoga. And part of that is because I do think so much of the spirituality and the foreignness of yoga has been taken out of it and it's part of a gym routine mm. it's part of of a male athlete professional athlete as a way to you know rehab or or stay healthy or, or enhance you know this productivity and, and when you look at like meditation today i think meditation is so flawed in america because it's all about a return on investment mm. like why meditation is used in corporate america is because it's meant to make more productivity out of your your worker and I actually think that's the last thing about meditation. Meditation is medicine. Mm -hmm. So if it's meant to have you just sit there and lie down and do nothing because that's healing, then that's what you do. And if it's meant to make you wander around and explore and be on like inner adventures, you know, none of that has to be about being more productive. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what's happened in America is yoga is part of a, a, of a gains. Mm -hmm. Do this to get that. And that's a very male, American male mindset, mm -hmm. right? Created by an American male. And so when I kind of bring up that Marlboro man, you know, like 
I, I, you know, like this is that depiction of that American male, the John Wayne, the, mm -hmm. the you know, um, Steve McQuinn, you know, like these sorts of, you know, the, these, these cowboy to, to, to modern day rebel kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. There's this stoic man who isn't in touch with his emotions. Mm -hmm. And I think the early experience of yoga was more of a man who was um, going to, one, be the minority walking into the room, mm -hmm. and two, suck at it because, you know, most men are just like stiff, right? So it's like, you know, so they're going to look around and be like, this sucks. You know, like mm -hmm. that woman can do this and I can't like, you know, going back to the gym, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to lift, I'm going to pick up a car, mm -hmm. you know, right? Like there's this vulnerability that happens inside mm -hmm. of the yoga room mm -hmm. that can be incredibly scary for American men who are never taught to be vulnerable. Do you think that goes back to language as well? Like you talked about the language that's used, um, how you discussed holding that space and how the experiences that they're having when they enter a yoga room for the first time could be that kind of language, that kind of connection. Do you feel most of the time, sometimes? I think I do. I do. I think, um, I think it's subliminal. Like un mm -hmm. I think it's subconscious. I don't think that we're necessarily aware uh, at first that the language is affecting it. But when you think about, you know, men and boys and, and versus, you know, women and, and, you know, you know, fathers to mothers, you know, the, the old paradigm, not the new one, but the old one was a much more dominating, authoritative male that was yelling, that was shaming, mm -hmm. that was putting down, that was expecting, you know, a certain um, effort. And then, and then the mothers who were way more um, accepting and, and um, embracing mm -hmm. and forgiving and so to walk into a yoga room, there's this level of, if I'm not perfect at it, like my stepdad's a wonderful example of it. He used to, you know, my, my mom and stepdad used to come take my yoga class when I was, you know, 19 and 20 and 21, when I was living, you know, back in the Detroit area and teaching. And he would only come to a class if he knew he could do every yoga pose. Oh. And I would say, how do you know? Like, did you get a phone call from the teacher before? Like, we're going to do, you know. So he liked things like Bikram or Ashtanga, right? Like where it's a set and you know what you're going to get, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, and so because the unknown, like I think is scarier for men than it is for, for women, mm. you know? Like women's bodies are so much more in a fluctuation of rhythms and, and, and pregnancy and all of these things, mm. you know, have to grow and hold the unknown where, where I, I think the male view is like this linear, you know, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to do this. And it's all about keeping score, and, you know, which is why boys maybe love sports. And then it's like keeping score goes to then your, your college, you know, entrance exams to your job, to the amount of money, to your cars and your house and all of this. And so asanas became another way of keeping score. Mm. And if you sucked at it, it was just easier not to go. I'm going to go back to the gym and I'm going to rack up, you know, 400 pounds on the bench press. And there you go. My, you know, right. worthy again. And the vulnerability I think was really scary until it became large enough that it was seen as something, you know, by society as, as a value, a virtue, not a liability to the male. Cause that man had to be strong, had to be stable, had to be that rock, mm -hmm. you know? And if all of a sudden, if that was being challenged by emotional releases, you know, and intuition and feel, and being softer and more fluid, you know, those were more these feminine traits, mm -hmm. you know, that I think in the 70s and 80s and 90s as, as yoga was landing in America was still not uh, recognized for, for men to embrace as much. You know, I think today it's a lot more um, accepted, you know, and, and seen and, and, and sought after. And we see it with our celebrities, you know, and, um, you know, even someone like as, as big and buff and, you know, like 
um, masculines like uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, mm -hmm. he's super like, you know, in tune with like a, a feminine, a femininity in a certain way, a vulnerability, yes. you know, so, you know, like a Tom Brady, you know, I mean, there's, you know, here he is with a cookbook on the TV 12 and, you know, like his, you know, like it's like we have male um, role models that are strong men that represent a much greater balance than we ever had. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to ask you, what are you doing now to uh, contribute to your uh, community now? What are your projects that we can share? And I also want to have another, if able, with you, uh, circle back to another interview with you to really dive into what you just talked about, the bodies and holding space, the difference between women and yeah. men's bodies. I love that you brought that up because that, that speaks a lot to where we're going with this. Yeah. So tell me in the next 10 minutes. Yeah, sure. So what, because I don't want to keep you. And I also have another interview after you that I'm excited to share too. So about music. <laughs> so, but I so, want to know that. <laughs> yeah. I, prior to the pandemic, I had really wanted to shift the schedule of my life, you know, and, um, you know, weekends with my son is just so valuable for yes. us and to travel and to be gone. And then I also wasn't enjoying being inside of yoga studios. And I was also looking and thinking like, I don't really think people are enjoying being inside yoga studios for 12 hours or more on weekends. And so I actually started more of an online, you know, community and platform. And I was doing online teacher trainings. Uh, I started doing them a year and a half ago. And so a lot of where, and like from a community standpoint, the yoga teachers lab is this idea to really explore, you know, anywhere from via online, um, you know, just incredibly high quality content and teaching. Um, so that's like what I've been doing from a teaching standpoint. And there's, you know, live stream classes, there's trainings. One What's of the, the website that we can get that at? Yogateacherslab.com. And there's um, online training there. We're doing um, Soul School with Sean Johnson this year for the first time online which is actually sold out. And um, my wife and I have, uh, you know, a monthly yoga membership for classes, things like that. Project wise, you know, I've been, we with through Soul School in New Orleans, we've been doing like people of color scholarships for four years. We've been doing anti-racist work within our yoga teacher trainings. And so that's a, something that's continued on. And my wife and I are doing a community of practice, which is a year long group towards really dedicated, or not dedicated, really focused towards white people, white bodied people getting together to have the difficult conversation amongst white bodies of how we can help change our own traumas and behaviors in our body to help shift this uh, systemic racism. So that's something that's going on. And we're doing that with our son's school as well. Um, and then, you know, Honestly, it's been a lot of ceremony um, for myself with, you know, ritual uh, with my wife and I. And I, I mean, I would say like one of the greatest practices that, that I have right now is just is, is you know, my relationship with her, um, you know, and how we just connect, you know, how we love each other. Um, that is ecstatic you know and 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 that's something that i think is missing amongst mm. male you know talks about you know what sex is you know our, our relationship you know as as men um you know tw you know towards all of these aspects that really harness you know a a, a true genuine power inside of ourselves mm -hmm. um which is not just you know the i think the the idea of power in america but like a you know a strength, but also like, again, that listening, like you can't love, you know, a woman if you're not listening to her, you know, it just doesn't work. You can't dominate. And I think that's like a mistake of what power is. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of real good things that could come. Unfortunately, it's a very touchy subject. Like, you know, you know, men gathering together is a wonderful thing inside of a yoga room in today's world. You know, I have to be incredibly careful with the things I say, 
with, with how I behave, which I understand and I completely agree with. It does though end up for other men, the messaging from men to men can be much stronger. And, and I do think that sometimes we do need you know, male spaces. There's a wonderful organization called Everyman, um, E-V-R-Y, um, man that, that only runs men only retreats um, that is very much about becoming vulnerable and emotional. Um, so I think like that's the movement of the future of American yoga is, is a much broader aspect moving outside of the physicality, moving into other ways that we can learn to meditate, this idea of welcoming, you know, any aspect of yourself rather than, you know, thinking I have to concentrate you know, because that's boring, but like welcoming in weird things, welcoming in the taboo, welcoming in lust, welcoming in that. I mean, it's just like, oh, right. This is me being human mm -hmm. and not being afraid to have those conversations in appropriate settings in the right, with the right audiences, you know, yeah. um, and the right guidance. So that's where my community stuff is. I'm always growing. I have no idea. <laughs> Can they find you on any of the social media platforms? Yeah, you can. I don't love social media, but I'm yoga teachers dot lab on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I, I, you know, I find myself, I just, I find myself doing the things that I'm interested in and, and it unfortunately doesn't interest me that much to broadcast my life. Um, so I tend not to, but you can find me there. But you can find your, your teachings there. Yes. <laughs> or pictures of that or information. You can find pictures. <laughs> So men know where to go and then they can go ahead and send you an email and message you and reach out to you as well there. And I lift, you know, I lift weights three times a week. Well, I don't lift weights. I do, I, I do resistance training with these incredible machines called ARX machines. And I train people on them. And so, yeah, like my body has changed so much. And as someone who's over 40 now, like, you know, what I put in my body, how I treat my body, you know, these are all things that, you know, fascinate me. Um, completely, you know, biohacking, all of that sort of stuff, you know, has been my passions for the last, you know, five or six years. So. Gosh, thank you so much, Mitchell. Bhakti, what a one unbelievable treat to see you. Thanks. You look radiant and amazing. Thank I'm you. So happy for you. Thank you so much. And I'm happy for you all and for all the success and the abundance and the blessings for your family and what you're doing for all the communities and all the people. It's just so inspiring to me. And I'm so blessed to have the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you so much. Reach out anytime. It's an honor. Please. Thank you so much. Till next time. Yeah, I love you. I love you too. Namaste. Namaste.